Good morning. It is Friday, September 7th, the week after my last uh, three-week jaunt around the country, which I will talk a little bit about today. Um, and I'm going to write several articles about it because the things I saw and the people I talked to uh, gave me a little bit of clarity uh, over some things that I wasn't so sure about. But now I have a little bit more clarity about. Now, for those of you who uh, are not members of Margin of Safety Investing, we have a pretty active chat board in here, and it gets a little bit political. And the reason it gets a little bit political is because one of the four pillars uh, that we use for uh, figuring out investments is the government and central bank role. So core four investing revolves around identifying the big secular trends, uh, understanding government and central bank roles, then getting to the fundamentals of sectors and industries. <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies are off the charts right now. And then finally, um, technical and quantitative analysis of price trends. So we have been talking a lot about Mr. Trump, President Trump on the, on the message board today. And uh, we have several people who are pretty big President Trump supporters and uh, believe in him that he's going to do the right things for the economy. And I am uh, not on that train. Uh, I want to be on that train because everybody should be rooting for the president to do a good job. Uh, but the problem that I see with President Trump is that he doesn't understand what is good for the economy and what's not. And a lot of people who believe in him don't understand either. So let's get to uh, the trade risks uh, that I talked about we'd be covering. So initially I said we talked about oil and the end of buyback bubble and trade risks, but let's start with uh, the trade risks because they're a big deal. As we've talked about before, we already know that the Fed is tightening and that ultimately if they tighten too much, that will be a problem. I don't like that the, I don't like the current Fed leadership. I said that from day one and I worry that he does not fully comprehend the slow growth forever world that I've identified for years now, four or five years I've been talking about slow growth forever. What is slow growth forever? Well, if you were watching Bloomberg today, they had three analysts on, three big shots that talked about what I've been talking about, which is that there's a big demographic uh, deflationary force that's out there that can't be overcome in any short period of time. It's going to take decades to get over the demographics, to get long-term growth back to two or 3% on a consistent basis. Unless we do a couple of smart things down the road, which we might, and that'll become uh, important to talk about in the future. But right now there's big deflationary forces and people worry about inflation. They just keep letting inflation come off of their mouth. Somebody asked me about the volume. Can you hear me? It seems like people can hear me. Would you like to be louder? Just fine. Okay. So the reality is that deflation is the real bogeyman, a real bogeyman. So you need to understand that deflation is what you should be worried about, not inflation. Inflation is a product at this point of monetary and fiscal policies to offset the deflationary forces, which are more natural, at least on the demographic side. Another deflationary force is all the debt overhang in the world. And that actually can be somewhat mitigated uh, through monetary actions. We've seen quantitative easing. That hasn't quite offset deflation um, but it has created asset inflation. And ultimately, in order to devalue these debts, uh, which virtually every country in the world uh, cannot handle. I mean, there's very few surplus countries out there. Saudi Arabia uh, is one of them. So when everybody talks about Saudi Arabia being in big trouble financially, I just laugh because they're a creditor nation. Have they borrowed the last few years as they beat the hell out of the oil super majors? Yeah, 
but that was part of their war. That was part of their Sun Tzu moment. So uh, Saudi Arabia will be in, in, in surplus in the next year or two, again, on their, on their annual, uh, annual budget, just as oil prices go up. So, let, let, but let, again, let's stick with uh, the trade issues. There is this idea out there among people who are very uh, uh, populist in their mind or nationalist in their mind that somehow um, forcing other nations to come to better trade deals with us uh, in the manner that we're doing is going to help the global economy and help the U.S. economy. And there's a lot of misnomers there. So the first thing we need to consider, and I don't have the charts today, but I have put the charts up before. The United States is one of the freest traders in the world. And that has led to us having the most powerful economy. Granted, you have to remember, we have some things that other nations don't have to begin with. We have the gift of the best geography on the planet, and that is a big deal, right? So the fact that we can basically um, handle most things internally if we really wanted to uh, in, in the event of an emergency, uh, that gives us a massive advantage. We have resources. We also have a relatively stable political system for as ugly and stupid as it sounds sometimes. Uh, we have a strong military. Nobody's coming in here to invade us. Uh, we have a workforce that is relatively well-trained, <clears throat> although it is deteriorating uh, because we do have some serious skills mismatches, and that is not a problem of trade policy. People need to understand that over 80% of jobs that have been lost in the last 30 years have been due to technology and a lack of people training for the new jobs. So when we don't educate, when we don't provide skills training, when we beat the hell out of the unions, which were the biggest training grounds out there until the last several years, then we have to replace what we've destroyed and we haven't done it. So right now, for the first time in history, there are more jobs available than people to fill those jobs. If you take a look at the traditional unemployment roles, I think it's kind of a horse race there. Um, I just drove through uh, 10 states and then, the Washington, and then spent time in Washington, D.C. And anybody who drives through Pennsylvania, go through Beaver County, Go through, go to Philadelphia, go to New York, and go to the non-waterfront areas, not Manhattan. Go to Queens, go to the inland part of Brooklyn, um, go, to, go to the Bronx, uh, go to Harlem, and what you're going to find, go to, over to Newark, and what you're going to find is a lot of people out of work or working for cheap. We haven't done a good job training people and educating people for the jobs that are available. There is over a million engineering jobs available in this country. A million. I think the number is actually closer to two and a half million. We have over a million uh, healthcare related jobs available in this country, technicians and, and, and nurses aides and nurses, uh, physicians assistants. So we have a major skills mismatch and anytime somebody says that that's not true, you, you, you really can't call bullshit on them. The numbers don't lie. We have 6 million or whatever it is unemployed that haven't gotten jobs, and we have 6 million jobs available out there, and they're, they're, not, they're not matching up because the people who want to work can't get into these jobs because they don't have anywhere close to the skills. So why does this matter? Because it plays into this narrative that somehow China stole our jobs, right? And Mexico stole our jobs and Indonesia stole our jobs and everybody's stealing our jobs. Get off of that. It's wrong. It's just plain wrong. Have some jobs relocated? Yes. Why is that? It has to do with two things. One, comparative advantage. Certain nations do certain things better. It also has to do with we have written tax policy and regulatory code that has encouraged um, our 
business people to move overseas. And it hasn't always been because they want to expand their markets. It's just because they want to play the arbitrage of cheap labor, right? So they go to where the cheap labor is and, and then our cheap labor over here is out of a job. So there is a little bit of that, but it's really a single digit percentage. So you want to understand how to get a better job you need to understand that the world is changing technologically, that skills are becoming higher skilled. And if you want a lower skilled job, you're going to have a harder and harder time getting it because most of the lower skilled jo jobs are getting automated and they're just not going to come back. Now, I will say this about President Trump's um, policies on trade. Some of them make a little bit of sense. It does make sense for the United States to have supply chains in key industries, such as oil, ele or excuse me, steel, electronics, you know, uh, semiconductors, solar panels. Those supply chains make sense to have here. And to the point where other nations are competing unfairly, China for the most part, it makes sense to confront them. Now, the way that he's doing it, which is, if you remember that game, that, that boxing game where you could, uh, the video game, where you could pick out your, your boxer. There was the drunk boxer, right? You had the drunk boxer. And I bet I can find him online. Drunk boxer. I bet he pops right up. Oh, maybe not. I hate to click on something and have it be not uh, not good. But, oh, there you go. Here it is, the drunk boxer. No, maybe not. Oh, look at that go. So, <laughs> you know, if I, I, these things just come out of my mouth and out of my head. So I, I, I wish I had prepared that for you. The, the Trump approach to trade policy has been the drunk boxer approach, right? You don't really know what he's doing. And, and people try to say that, and we had this discussion on our chat board today, people are trying to say that it's some sort of elite strategy to tactically be um, uh, unpredictable. Yes, there is some truth to that. You want some unpredictability. But the reality is that in order to get things done, you can't just try to run over other world leaders. The United States has a lot of power. But when you start pissing off your allies, then you don't have anybody to line up and rally against your, your real competitors out there. And, and I'm not going to call China an enemy. They are not an enemy. Russia, probably an enemy. But China... Look, they don't usually go beyond their borders when it comes to military or anything like that. They invest in other places. They move people around the world. There's no doubt about that. But in reality, China is trying to feed a billion and a half people and get them out of poverty so that they don't get unruly. Do any of us, and I ask this question any, all the time, do we really want the Chinese to be cold and hungry? No, that'd be stupid because then they would want to have a war. So it makes sense for China to do well for us. It makes sense for them to do well for them. And we should not be hurting China. This idea that there's IP technology theft, sure, there is. We do it too, though. And if anybody doesn't believe that the United States steals technology from other nations, man, you got another thing coming. You just, you, you are not in the world of technology, right? So is it true that China has cut deals with our manufacturers and said, hey, you got to share your technology with us or have a local partner? Yes. Now, our corporations could have said no, right? The CEOs could have said no. Why didn't they, Right? Why didn't our corporation say, no, we don't want to do a deal that way? It's a pretty easy answer. Somebody posted. Why didn't our CEOs say, no, we don't want to have these captive deals? Starts with a dollar sign and ends with a dollar sign. These guys just wanted to make money for themselves and get their bonuses. 
So now they've shared technology. They've put themselves in a position where they lose their technology and then they run around blaming the Chinese. Nobody held a gun to their head to cut those deals. So to put pressure on the Chinese because our corporate leadership went around the world cutting deals that probably shouldn't have been cut just because they wanted to make more and more money, you know, you need to take a look at what really has happened, the corporate uh, compensation versus middle class and labor uh, compensation. In the last 37 years, 37 years, I point to 1981 for a reason, but in the last 37 years, the real wage rate for Americans, working Americans, right, the not top 1%, have basically stayed the same when inflation, which is monetary, is factored in. But corporate executive compensation, how much is that up? I don't even know anymore. Hundreds and hundreds of percent. Should we take a look? CEO comp sensation all right there you go compensation that's ceos but if we compare it to labor there you go this is on cnbc and they're pro big business Where's the line chart? It's going to be here. Oh, they didn't have the line chart. Well, I, I encourage you to do this search. I haven't had, again, there you go. What's this one? This one looks like CEO to employee pay ratios. How's that? Guess who the uh, blue line is, right? So you can just go here, CEO to worker compensation ratio. You know, wh why was it here through the early 80s and now it's way up here? 300 to one. So the average person in America makes 25,000. No, I take that back. It's 50,000. 25,000 is the poverty rate, give or take. So $50,000. times 300. Why does the average CEO make $15 million, give or take? You know, just, just go to these sources, Economic Policy Institute. Why is this the way it is all of a sudden? Why does that make sense? Does it help you? Does it help me? Does it help the country? No. You want to hold somebody accountable, and I'm just going to say this one more time. Hold corporate America accountable. The Chinese are doing what the Chinese need to do to feed their people and keep them healthy, hungry, not hungry. Um, the biggest theft in America is from, from the executive class. There's just no doubt about that. And, you know, some of us who can make big six figure incomes, you know, in middle management or some sort of management, hey, that's great. And there are people who earn in the millions of dollars who genuinely deserve and earn it. I have no beef with that. But when you take a look at corporations, they haven't really done anything for shareholders for a long, long time uh, or for their employees for a long, long time. Yet the executive compensation goes up and up and up and up and up and up like, like a sports player, which doesn't make much sense either. You have to start asking your questions. What is that economically? That's a big skim. I'm Italian. That's a racket. So if we really want to fix America, let's not focus on the Chinese trying to feed their people. Uh, maybe we should focus on the 1% class here, and really it's much less than that, that are hoarding 50, 60, 70% of the money. This gigantic tax break that we just got is going to end up being very damaging to the economy. In the short term, it's a stimulus, but around 90% of that money, in fact, did go to the richest 1% of people, either through direct tax cuts 
or through the buybacks that we're going to talk about next. So if you're concerned about your wealth two, three, four years out, you need to think very clearly about who it is that's damaging America. Because I just drove across 10, 10 different states, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of bad things in the St. Louis area. Right? I was in East, East St. Louis. Uh, you know, I make a point to go into these places. I, I was down in a, in a tough part of Chicago. I drove across Indiana, Ohio. Ohio's not so bad, um, at least from what I could see. Pennsylvania, man, Pennsylvania is beautiful country. And yet you have towns like, you know, Beaver, Beaver Falls, Be Big Beaver in Beaver County, uh, which is where Mr. Belvedere was, I believe. Um, and, and these areas are just bombed out. I'm going to show, I'm going to write an article that shows the pictures of what I saw. And, and you're just not going to be able to get over it. These are cities that are nine years after financial crisis, the only new buildings are government buildings, health and human services, right? Uh, and, and housing projects. Why, why haven't they figured out a way to drive some entrepreneurship there? It's a beautiful area, right? Why don't 10,000 people from Brooklyn, which frankly, parts of Brooklyn suck. Why are people sitting in Brooklyn hopeless with rats and cockroaches? Why won't they go to Beaver County or, or some other places that are just crap? You know, this whole drive we have, and I blame this more on the Democrats than anybody, uh, so don't don't look at this as me being Democrat or Republican. I, I have said over and over again, both parties suck. But we keep driving people to the big cities, and it doesn't make any sense. There's not enough opportunity there. We need more small business. We need more of the small towns to come back. We have the technology to do it, right? The Internet makes it possible to do business almost anywhere. We need services. You know, I had a hard time finding a good cafe in Beaver County. There is a few, but it's not like, you know, what it is in a lot of other parts of the country when I drive the highway. So, again, I understand why people voted for Trump, right? I'm from Wisconsin. I hang out in Michigan. I hang out across the Midwest. You know, I do a lot of driving in this area. I follow the poker tour uh, somewhat. Uh, and I vacation around here, I fish, whatever. Um, the reason, and I wrote about this back on uh, my, my firm website, I predicted that Trump was going to win, right? And I talked about his challenges. And I talk about how he could be a great president. I, I just don't think he's going to pull it off because I don't think he understands what he needs to really do. Um, I think he has tapped into a populism, but ultimately the tax cuts that he gave were basically the Trump family tax code. You know, I mean, the tax breaks that the Trump family are going to get are literally in the, in, the, in the tens of millions of dollars and if not hundreds of millions. And, 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 and how does that trickle into the economy? It doesn't. Right, it's just a way to accumulate more wealth for, for whatever reason. But the reason why people in the Midwest, and I have had this argument with a couple of my East Coast friends who just think that the Midwest screwed the country by electing Trump, and maybe we did. But the reason why Trump won, it's very simple, very simple. People in the Midwest feel abused by people from the East Coast particularly New York and Washington, D.C. That's it. That's all it is to it. It was a protest vote by a group of disgruntled people who have lost jobs, lost family security, have seen their neighborhoods deteriorate, and they want to say, hey, enough of this shit. They didn't think Hillary Clinton was the answer because she's very establishment. Frankly, I think she would have done a better job, but I don't know that it was her spot in history. I think she missed her chance. And uh, for whatever that's worth, uh, President Trump could 
still salvage his presidency if he didn't do anything really illegal in the past. And I'm not so sure about that. So uh, what could he do? He could go to China and say, look, I know that you need to feed all these people and keep all these people happy. Let's find a middle ground. If he took the marginal improvement in trade and stopped being so demanding about things that don't really matter, right? I'm telling you, the IP uh, theft issue is so overblown uh, that I just, it, you know, and we're just looking in the wrong place. You, you, want, you want to fix that, deal with the people here at home, right? Deal with the people here at home. As far as the tariffs with NAFTA, tell you what, NAFTA by far has been successful. Are there inequalities? Yes. But again, that's not really the trade agreement's fault. That's people within America finding loopholes and ways to uh, manipulate the system. We need to focus on our problems. You know, when you grew up, didn't your parent ever tell you, look, you can only control what you can control? You need to control your behavior. Well, when I say your behavior, I, I mean our behavior as Americans. We need to fix our behavior because our behavior is doing it to ourselves. There's a book out there called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I would encourage you all to read it. I read this uh, new edition. Um, while I was on vacation. I read the original, whatever it was, 13, 14 years ago. This book by a guy named John Perkins talks about his experience and he's uh, updated it to talk about the last seven or eight years. And there's a very simple thing that we have done as Americans to the rest of the world uh, that is why a lot of countries don't like us. We drive up their debt, right? We cut deals with them. We manipulate them. Um, and, the, and then we really kind of abuse them. And, and not that we do that a lot, but we do it enough to piss people off. We have to avoid doing that because we're in a day and age where our power is going to continually be diminished. Why? Because everybody else is growing too, right? Our power is largely economic. And for us to maintain our economic primacy, we have to be trusted and we have to be respected and people have to want to do business with us. We are endangering all those things right now because we are becoming a South Park episode. They took our gerbs. They took our gerbs. They did not take our jobs. So you need to get over that. Get over these small little things that make you think, hey, we need to, you know, stick it to the Europeans. We need to stick it to the Canadians. We need to stick it to the Mexicans. We need to stick it to China. Maybe a little bit China. But the rest of them, this is just bad policy. And if it goes any further, if we don't cut marginal trade deals, that sh uh, trade deals that show marginal improvement, but none of this, you know, over-the-top stuff, we're going to have a problem. And I've become convinced, not convinced, but I certainly doubt that President Trump and his staff, the people that actually he listens to, um, get that the trade policies in the United States are pretty damn good. Really are. There doesn't need to be wholesale change. There needs to be tweaking. With most economic systems, there needs to be tweaking constantly. Right? As one hole pops up, you figure out how to fix it. But trade, look, when you include services and in trade, the United States runs a surplus with most countries. You can't just say goods but not services, right? The economy is goods and services. So are we producing fewer goods relative to some of our trade partners? Yes. But are we providing more services than they provide us? Yes. And by the way, the services are higher paid. So this idea 
that uh, we're in uh, a trade deficit with Canada. That's wrong. We run a trade surplus with Canada when you figure in all the services we provide them. So, you know, we need to take a look at that. And our trade balance with China, when you figure in services, it's a pretty narrow deficit. So if we want more jobs here, I would tell you it's not trade policy that's, that's, that's caused the problem. It's lack of education. It's lack of training. It's lack of getting people the skills they need to fill the higher end jobs that are here now. We want the higher end jobs. Why? They pay more. That's a higher standard of living. Let's train 6 million people on these jobs that are unfilled, right? Stop climbing on to trade policies that don't really help us. All right. Let's talk about oil. Did they make any questions about the trade? I know that I rant on that, um, but it's important. You know, if you know here, you 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 really want to understand what's going on here. <laughs> there you go. Watch South Park. There you go. Do we do we need to, do we need to watch a clip? I don't know if I can ever get these to come in anyway, but. Watch South Park. I don't have the plug-in. They didn't really take our jobs. All right. Our oil strategy. I wish I could how do I make this shrink. That's not what I want. There we go. All right. So I've been talking up oil for the better part of two years. Two and a half basically about the time that it bottomed. We need to understand that oil is a patient trade and that there are a lot of catalysts lined up to push oil higher. So when we talk about being invested in oil, uh, we, you know, we have a lot of people getting impatient because we're having a minor correction right now. But the long term, Oil remains in balance to slight shortage, and that will remain the case until electric vehicles start to reduce oil demand. Approximately 2030 is my guess. So I'm overweight oil stocks and own a bit of oil as well. Um, the S&P 500 weight to energy is 6 or 7%. I suggest considering a triple to quadruple weight. So here's that S&P 500 breakdown, right? Energy, 5.9%. Eh, that was a little over six recently. I want to be much higher. Why? Because I'm not particularly convinced that healthcare has much of a run left. When you take a look at the charts, um, healthcare has just done unbelievable since Obamacare. And uh, frankly, the, the economy can't afford it. So at some point, the politicians are going to put the kibosh on all of the gouging that goes on in healthcare. And if you don't think there's gouging and, and inefficiencies in healthcare, man, you're not paying attention because the way that we handle the drugs is just wrong. It is just unbelievably wrong. The way that we are doing insurance now, um, yes, there's more access because of the exchanges, but uh, the way that they do billing and administration and the way that they do things is just too damn expensive. So, you know, if we really want the economy not to implode under the weight of an aging population, the politicians are gonna have to do something to control healthcare costs. Ultimately, healthcare has to be regulated like a utility. Why? Because there's monopoly pricing pressure. Any good or service that can't be replaced with something similar has monopoly pricing pressure. Healthcare has monopoly pricing pressure. They raise rates, they raise rates, they raise rates because there's nothing you and I can do about it even if we shop around. This idea that we're gonna go doctor to doctor looking for a cheaper rate, come on, let's be realistic, you're sick. You're not gonna be shopping doctors. So, you know, we basically listen to the pharmacist tell us here, this is what you can do. Well, if you ask for a, 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 a generic, maybe they'll tell you. 
you know, I think the pharmacists are better at that than almost anybody. So I'm underweight healthcare. I'm underweight financials because I think there's just so much risk there and limited upside. Consumer staples bore me to tears. There's just not a lot of gains to be made there. Where I want to be is information technology, consumer destructionary. After a recession, I'll buy industrials. Um, there's one utility I like that's Dominion Energy, triple to quadruple. Real estate, because most of us own homes, there's not a lot of reason to invest in real estate. I know that there's entire services dedicated to REITs out there, but we own, we own store capital, right? Margin of safety investors own store capital. Bought it around 25, it's around 29 in the last year, uh, and it pays a dividend. There's a reason why store capital is uh, valuable, uh, and it's because they actually tap into the entrepreneurship, which is where the real growth is, and generally um, where you can avoid seeing mass defaults. So certain real estate, uh, retail real estate trusts, they could run into problems because they don't do the types of um, financial analysis that store capital does. So I like store capital. Um, somebody just put an article on the free side of Seeking Alpha. It's a good article. Uh, so go ahead and check out STOR. It's the only real estate I really own. Although I will say, mortgage REITs are going to make a comeback. Um, and I don't know when. It could be a few years out. But the reason mortgage REITs are going to probably make a comeback is that interest rates really aren't going to go much higher. Then we're, we're roughly at the natural rate of interest. Um, if we if we raise it much higher, the economy will slow down. So, you know, I would expect long-term rates not to go up much more. Uh, and the reason for that is that the people who control all that money in the bonds, they understand what I'm saying about slow growth forever. And again, go take a look at the videos on Bloomberg today. Uh, they talked about this five years after I did, but they talked about it. The demographics and the over, debt overhang and even technology are deflationary, not inflationary. So, uh, you know, real estate, utilities, financials, you really have to think of those in a different light in a world where interest rates really don't go up much. Ben Bernanke, several years ago, said he did not expect interest rates to go up to the long-term norm, norm or average of the last 50 years during his lifetime. I don't think he's 70 yet, right? So he's talking a generation before we see five, six, seven percent interest rates again on US 10 year US treasuries. I think that's probably right. We have to get through all of this demographic uh, overhang, you know, the aging population, because older folks spend less money uh, on everything else that's in the economy other than healthcare, which is why we have to control healthcare. Um, and the debt that's out there has to be devalued by inflation. And the way that they're doing it isn't working. The way they're going to do it will work. They will eventually print helicopter money. There will eventually be a 5 to $10 trillion drop of money into the economy that will bail out pensions, maybe student loans, uh, create some sort of sustainable infrastructure fund, it's coming when, I don't know, sometime in the 2020s. And that's why I'm very optimistic long-term uh, because I just don't think we're gonna drive ourselves into a depression. And again, having been in a lot of states again this year, I'm telling you, there is no appetite to keep bifurcating America into haves and haves nots, especially as many people in the middle class slowly become have-nots after having had some security financially. It's a dangerous situation if we keep going in the direction that we are where fewer and fewer people have more and more and more. And, and I say that as a guy making six figures, um, but I don't really look at the entrepreneurs as, as the problem. Again, I'm telling you, big corporations and the super wealthy have found you know, and people say, well, it's their money. They can do what they want. No, no. Study economics. The only way for money to get that concentrated is for there to be an inefficiency in the system. 
and inefficiencies have to be adjusted for, whether it's monopoly pricing pressure or regulatory issues or resource issues, whatever, right? I mean, realistically, it doesn't make any sense that Google is a near monopoly. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make much sense that Monopoly, uh, that uh, Monopoly, that uh, Microsoft is a near monopoly. It doesn't make any sense. So this idea that these corporations that have monopoly pricing power or are part of oligopolies um, are good for the economy, it's not true. Now, is it good for investors? Yes. Oligopoly is a good word for investor. And that's why I own a lot of oligopolies. I own Google. I own Nutrien, which is one of a handful of uh, uh, fertilizer producers. I own oil producers because we don't have a substitute for oil yet, right? I know to invest in the oligopolies, but at the same time, I know that they're probably bad for the broader economy and Americans' overall standard of living because we could probably make more money on, more, on smaller companies that are growing and discerning who the growth stories are versus trying to invest in the largest companies that simultaneously are good for that handful of investors, but not so good for the, the broader economy. Telecommunication services, we just got heavier into that. Why? Because there's consolidation because there's consolidation in the space, giving companies like AT&T and Verizon more pricing power. So while they're in this trough, I like buying them. Do I think it's good for me as a consumer that I'm going to have fewer national choices for broadband? No, I don't. I don't like the Sprint T-Mobile merger. I think they should be cutting deals with the regional companies so that we have four national providers for 5G and broadband and telecommunications versus three, right? Because I'm, then we would get a little bit more um, competitive pressure on pricings. What did AT&T just do? AT&T just raised a couple of segregated fees that are going to raise over $2 billion a year for them. Are you going to complain about that 75 cents extra a month? No. Did it happen? Absolutely. And is it going to happen more? For sure. So we need to understand um, how these pricing issues work. When it comes to oil, um, there's an oligopoly here, right? You've got OPEC, you got the United States, you have Russia. That's pretty much the whole game. And so I know that I can make money in oil because Saudi Arabia has effectively defeated the oil majors. That's why I've written articles like Exxon and Chevron are no longer forever stocks. They can't go offshore and do a billion dollar project that takes 10 years to pay them back anymore. Why? Combination of things. One, Saudi Arabia has shown that they can flood the market with oil, so that scares them. And two, we know that electric vehicles are coming. What just happened this week? Not a Tesla story, but Mercedes-Benz said, hey, we're going full on electric vehicles. There's no other choice. It's coming. And it's coming faster than people think. Will it be two, three, four years from now? Um, like Tony Siba says, no. But is it going to be 25 years from now before oil demand goes down? <laughs> no, it's not going to take 25 years. It's going to take between five and 15 years. Hard to know where. I'm, I'm going to say pretty much down the middle, 2030-ish, um, is when oil demand turns over. And once it turns over, it'll go down and down and down. Demand for oil will fall and fall and fall as people retire their internal combustion engine vehicles. <clears throat> because Saudi Arabia knows that that's coming, that is when the price of oil will go down because they will hold on to market share and wipe everybody else out again, 2030-ish. So expect us to stay on this peak oil plateau for about a decade, right? I talked about it here. I think we've had all this right, right? You know, we get some choppiness in the stocks because people are like, oh, inventories didn't go down enough, whatever. Enough, there's been enough destruction for new production, right? There's been enough oil sands that came off, enough deep water that's not getting developed, 
and you've got Venezuela and Iran and Libya and Nigeria and a bunch of com countries that can't keep their production up. You know, you got the sanctions on Iran, a little bit different, but it is what it is. So the catalysts for oil are this. Oil supply and demand are in balance and there will be periods of small shortage. The dynamic is driven by the fact that deep water oil is not coming back in any significant way. The majors can't put those investments in. They don't have the money. You're going to see Exxon and Chevron undergo a number of strategic transactions in coming years. I think for sure they're going to spin off their pipelines. All their mid-tier stuff, they're going to spin it all off. And I don't know what else they're going to spin off. Probably upstream and midstream. So expect that to happen. And regulators should be wise. They won't be, but they should be wise um, to Exxon and Chevron spinning off their midstream and upstream uh, and in using the money properly. They should use that money to pay off debt exclusively because otherwise they will never pay off their debts. And then, then they'll be asking for a bailout in 10 or 15 years. So, you know, keep an eye on the upstream and the midstream uh, asset sales from Exxon and Chevron. They're coming. I don't know how fast, but they're coming. I would guess that they're midstream sales, judging from the fact that Occidental already sold off some midstream. Um, I think you might see Exxon and, and Chevron uh, do it sooner than later. They might even merge their midstream assets and spin it off into a whole new company. So most oil companies are looking for short cycle projects, which is shale and shallower water offshore. The problem is that there isn't much shallow water offshore to drill anymore. Um, so they're using it up. And we also know that there's not all that much shale actually. By the middle of 2020, shale is gonna be turning over and there'll be less production. So, you know, that those are all reasons why supply really is not gonna be a problem uh, on the upside or the downside until later in the uh, uh, next decade. The wild card, of course, is, is there a greater war in the Middle East? And that's why I hold some calls on companies like Continental Resources and own the uh, USOU um, oil fund uh, because if there's a spike in oil prices, Continental Resources is not hedged. They'll do very well. USOU could spike real high, um, and I want a piece of that if it happens. Do I think there's going to be more war in the Middle East? Again, I give it a coin flip. I, I don't really know. Um, I think that the possibility, which most people thought was close to zero a couple of years ago, is, is, is over 50% right now. Um, it would not surprise me to see between September 11th and November 4th or whenever the elections are, sometime in September, October. It would not surprise me to see the Israelis and the Americans attack Iranian forces that are not stationed within Iran proper. I just don't think that that's a far-fetched idea. I think it is, uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why it could happen. So we'll just leave it at that. So any oil questions? But I, I did post this for people because I think that they were getting lost uh, in, in why we're doing the oil trade. Uh, the fact that it's probably a shorter term trade, two, three years, and not a 10 year trade. But um, here, here it is. Here's, here's uh, the, the, why we're not changing the oil strategy. And I'll publish this at Fundamental Trends as soon as the call is over. I just, uh, I just finished this. All right. Um, talked about trade, talked about oil. What did I miss? I missed something. What did I miss, folks? Oh, the bubble. Yeah, the buyback bubble. Come on. So I've talked about the buyback bubble. And right now, buybacks, and I, and I talked about this in an article a while back, right? I talked about the marginal, as you can hear, I have dogs. 
garbage the garbage man must have came. So it's time to be a stock seller. I talked about how the marginal buyer in the market has disappeared. And I showed some charts from Yardini. And and this is the chart that I think is, is very telling. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Just want to make this bigger. There we go. So who's the marginal buyer in the stock stock market? Who is buying the dips, right? The person who is buying the dips has traditionally been somebody who has somehow gotten a hold of money through the quantitative easing. So money came through the primary dealers, the money got reloaned, the money got used to buy assets. The Chinese up until last year were also marginal buyers. So what do we know? We know that QE has ended. We know the United States is tightening. The Fed is even sh uh, shrinking their balance sheet. The somebody pounding on my door. The dogs don't like that at all. Um, we also know the Chinese have backed off on foreign direct investment in the United States. So what is holding the stock market up? It is the buybacks. We know that we're going to see about a trillion dollars of buybacks this year, right? We saw the Chinese investments fell off. They're they're actually close to zero right now. So if we take a look at the other chart, the buyback chart, oh, I'm not in here. If you go to Yardeni, Yardeni talks about buybacks. If you haven't used this website, you should. It's awesome. So the United States is gonna, uh, companies are going to buy back about a trillion dollars of the stock. Half of that money came from the repatriation. Of the trillion dollars that's going to be buying back U.S. stocks, only about half of that money has gotten used in the first three quarters of the year. And that means that half of that money is going to get packed into the fourth quarter of the year. So while I think the market will be choppy in the next month or two, and I think we could see that 5 or 10% correction, maybe even a 20% correction. I think we see a huge rally in the fourth quarter. I think we get the 3,000 on the S&P 500, which I predicted last summer, so a year and a half ago, almost a year and a half ago, last July. Um, I think it happens in the fourth quarter. You have to remember, corporate executives are motivated by money. Corporate executives have sold off more corporate stock uh, in this year than ever before. The types of numbers that we saw in 2007. At the same time, they're doing buybacks with a trillion dollars. So basically, they're using the repatriated money to buy back stock in their corporations at the same time cashing out their options and their shares. What does that tell you? It tells me we better watch out. So while I'm very confident we get a big fourth quarter rally and we get all the FOMO people, right? All the FOMO people, fear of missing out because they don't understand why the market's going to go up. They, they just think it's going up and they, they attribute it to their political beliefs. They attribute it to the fact that they have a job. Whatever they attribute it to, they rationalize. But the numbers say that the marginal buyer in the stock market right now is corporate buybacks. When the corporate buybacks get cut in half next year, which is about what's going to happen, we're going to have a problem. That's a half a trillion dollars not buying stocks next year. It's a lot of money. So I think that we can get into January without getting particularly beat up, but I think it's very possible that we see a replay next winter of what happened last winter. So last December and January, I told my subscribers, hey, volatility is too low. This is what's going on. This is how the market is structured. We're going to see a rise in volatility. And what happens? We got the rise in volatility. And a lot of subscribers bought those VIX calls I told them to buy, and they made a lot of money. I think that trade is coming again. Somebody just asked me on the message board um, over actually at both websites, 
um, when am I going to get back into the VXX trade? And I said when VXX, when actually when the VIX proper gets down to around 10. I don't know if it'll go single digits again. It might. If we get this big rally at the end of the year, maybe we finally get euphoria in the markets. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I, th I think that'll be as close as we get. There's enough people, and we have to remember, baby boomers may never get back in the stocks as much as they were, probably won't. Um, there's enough people who are permanently out of stock market that we may not get the same type of euphoria that we've gotten in the past. So we have to measure it in relative terms. I think we'll get whatever our euphoria is. I think it'll be more extreme than it was last December and January, this coming December and January. And then, and then we better be careful next year because once this buyback money is used up, and these guys are not going to wait until next year to use it, right? Should they spread the money out over a couple of years? Probably, but they want their bonus this year. So they get their bonuses this year. They need to drive those stock prices up because that's how most of them are measured. So I would, uh, um, I, I would keep an eye on that. I think this buyback bubble is done right around the start of the year. Maybe a little before, maybe a little after, hard to know. Uh, but the money will be gone, half a trillion dollars coming out of the stock market next year. That's a big deal. All right, let's do the question and answers and be done in about an hour. Uh, have you read The 100-Year Marathon by Michael Pillsbury? No. It is a more alarmist view on China. Yes, I am more complacent about China. Yes, China, a lot of countries uh, harbor resentment. And that's why we have to not stimulate that resentment. Bottom line. You know, it's one thing to try to develop supply chains. You can do that mostly through domestic policy. And you can even negotiate better deals and say to China, hey, we need compensation for our technology. We don't want to hold you guys back but we need to get paid for things that we share with you. It can't just go to our corporate executives, right? So there's ways to do that. It's not even that hard. Uh, the fact that everybody wants to pound their chest and say, I got a bigger, you know what than you, um, is just, it's just kind of garbage. The S and P 500 is going to do some reshuffling of sec sectors. Yeah. So, the communica telecommunication sector is basically getting folded into a communication sector that will actually pull out some technology names too. Um, I, I like that for AT&T or Verizon, right? If all of a sudden they're in an ETF with Facebook and Google, you know, and some other tech names, you know, now all of a sudden they get the pull of that, you know, they get the push of that money that they weren't getting into their ETF. So, it's a negative probably for the companies that are in tech going to communications ETF, but it's a positive for the telecommunications company going, uh, companies going from the telecommunications ETF to the communications ETF. So that's what's going on. The telecommunications ETF will be gone. There'll be a communications ETF that will include some of these tech names. Buyback bubble, huge. Yeah, it is a huge buyback bubble. Uh, and, and the fact that the stock market is not higher just really points out to the deflationary forces that I've been talking about. You know, it's taken a trillion dollars to keep this market from going down. Think about that. No, I did not say hedge all through December 31st. I said that I expect a correction now-ish, September, October. The reason you hedge a little longer is in case you're wrong. <laughs> Somebody just made a crack about Elon Musk. Um, I think that we're hedging now. We'll take our profits on that at some point, and then we'll hedge again when the buyback bubble is over. But I think, you know, unfortunately, I think there's like three swing trades, one that we're doing now, one that we'll do later, then one we'll do after that. I don't like the swing trade, but this is pretty apparent to me what's going on. And last year when I did this, it, it worked out. I think it's going to be very similar to last year. So the hedges that we have on now, we'll take profits on 
uh, at some time in the next month or two, or maybe we don't get a correction and we just have to cut our losses. Um, I think the end of the year rides up pretty pretty smoothly, uh, pretty hard actually. You know, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a big rally in November December, um, maybe even into January. If that VIX number gets down to around ten, that's when you know, hey, let's let's really let's really load up on hedges. You know, let actually at that point you almost speculate on the drops, right, and the volatility. Right now we're just hedging with five, six, seven, eight percent of our money, but you know, if we get a VIX down around ten again, those bets get a little bit bigger because uh because the reality gets a little easier to see. Um somebody said Elon Musk is getting a lot of euphoria lately. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I, I've said over and over again, I don't think the car companies are place to make money in EVs. I think it's the tech companies. I think it's, you know, I think it's the telecom companies. Cause they're going to need the uh, 5G is imperative self-driving cars to work. Bottom line, that's true. You can't have latency. So, you know, I, I like all those companies. Uh, you know, we're, we're in four or five companies that are 5G plays. I know somebody talked about the health issues with a 5G, but somebody else pointed out, actually, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, 4G technology that we're using now is probably, if there's, a, if there's a health consequence, probably more dangerous than the 5G technology. Because the 5G technology is like a beam, more or less versus the 4G technology, which is just pervasive. So, you know, are there health issues with telecom? You know, we've all worried that we're getting brain cancer. Um, I, I will say this, one of the reasons I use my speakerphone, and some people don't like that, but the, one of the reasons I use a speakerphone and a wired headset is because I don't want right next to my head, in my ear, the radio waves. Am I paranoid? I don't know, I call it being careful. All right. Um, I like Sun Power, and I will like Sun Power a long time. Um, it's about five percent of my portfolio. I could see it getting up to eight soon. What about Micron? I think that the sell-off due to NAND was overdone. NAND is not where they make most of their money. They make most of their money on DRAM, and I have already talked about how the pricing for DRAM and NAND were going to flatten out, uh, maybe even drop a few percent. But you're still looking at Micron making 10 or $11 billion next year in profits. Oh, excuse me, 10 or $11 a share in earnings per share. And they're buying back about a billion dollars a month in, a, in a stock right now. So I haven't even looked at, uh, um, let's do a quick shortcut here. You know, Verizon owns this, right? Verizon owns Yahoo. And they're starting to make it better finally. Um, Micron, up a little bit. So I sold puts on Micron yesterday. I already owned calls. So my calls are underwater about 20%. And my puts are at least going in the right direction today. Um, I, I don't think there's any big problem with Micron. Again, somebody made a comment, an Asian subscriber, I think, uh, said that basically questioned whether there are a lot of s stupid people in the market. Here, let me answer that. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of really bad investors out there. Like 60% of investors are outright bad. You know, it's not a bell curve. About 60% of investors are outright bad at it. About 20% of the people, you know, if they stick with ETFs, they're probably okay. And then about 20% of the people really make all the money. And in fact, it's not even 20%, it's about 10%. About 10% of the investors make all of the excess returns in the market. I'm in that group. And I will tell you that uh, it's hard, but the trick, here's the trick, is just take advantage of those 80% that are either average or worse, knowing that three quarters of that 80%, most of them are worse right? Just don't make their mistakes and you're going to be fine. Now, if you want to be in that second 20%, you basically can index. And when Buffett tells people to index, it's because he knows that 60% of, 60 of them or more aren't doing as well as the index. 
So it would be better for them just to index rather than making bad investments and saying, well, my 401k is managed. No, it's not. People say stupid things about their 401k all the time because they don't understand them. 401ks, for the most part, are expensive and unmanaged. Do you have a bunch of mutual funds you can pick from? Sure. That doesn't mean that people are managing your asset allocation, though. I mean, the 401k stupidity that's out there actually led me to buy a website uh, that I'll get started eventually. And I'm going to give it away for dirt cheap because if people don't manage their 401ks better, man, my taxes are going to be through the roof in 10 or 20 years because nobody's going to have any money except for 20% of the population. And that's not good. That's not good at all. You know, I know everybody thinks about their slice of the pie, but really in economics, it's having a pie that's getting bigger. That's what wins for everybody, right? Because if you're smart enough, you'll get your slice, but you need the pie to grow. You can't support policies that keep the pie from growing, which tax cuts for the ultra rich. That's bad for the pie. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, thoughts on the solar cell sell-off in recent days? Eh, days. Days. Who cares about days? I don't care about days. You know, bad days leave, lead to good investments, right? I love when the market trades stupidly, stupidly in one direction. Why? Because if there's something that they sell off that I was waiting to buy, it gives me a chance. If you're not already in sun power or first solar, you should be nibbling in. 652 on sun power. Heck yeah. Right? And I'm showing you my portfolio holdings right there. So, uh, so a little bit more on Micron. Micron is part of an oligopoly, right? So when you take a look at my portfolio, part of an oligopoly, part of an oligopoly, part of an oligopoly, high growth, part of an oligopoly, part of an oligopoly, part of an oligopoly, high growth, potential turnaround play, oligopoly, 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 oligopoly. You know, have you noticed the trend here? We want companies that have pricing power. Being in a consolidating industry is usually good for that. Having monopoly pricing power through oligopoly is another way is the main way. Exit strategy on the XOP calls. Yeah, we're going to have to figure that one out in the next couple of months. But I, I'd say that we're probably selling in the next few months. Uh, investing quite a bit in China. So, one of the things, and we just don't have time to go really in-depth in it, is China. China hasn't bottomed yet. And you have to understand the issues facing Tencent and JD and BABA um, because they're important issues. And they might not be overcome quickly. So I think that KWeb, the ETF, I think that's the way I'm going to do it. Um, I like Tencent. I do. But... You know, unless they get dirt cheap, I got to be careful because the government has so much control there, right? So, you know, ex invest in the extremes, right? Avoid the middle of markets because you don't know what direction up or down things are going to go. Invest in the extremes. So if KWeb goes down further, I don't know if I even have it. There we go. It's not down to 44 yet. You know, I said 44 is a price that I'm looking for. And at that point, I'll, you know, I'll analyze whether or not it's, it's a falling knife. So when you take a look at the holdings here, you get all those really good companies, right? You get the companies you want. You get Tencent, you get Alibaba, you get JD. But yeah, take a look at the technicals. Take a look at your cheek, your money flow. This is my favorite measure of money flow. It's still not taking in money. If you take a look over the weekly, I bet it's worse. Yeah, it's worse. So this isn't healthy. I mean, if, 
I don't know that this 200 day is going to hold. You know, we need to see it bounce around in here without going through. There, this is going to take some time to play out. So be careful with China. Uh, the emerging markets in general, you're going to have a hard time with. We don't know if these 200 day moving averages are going to hold. This is the one I like. I, I really would like to own Indian small cap stocks. But again, it could go down our 10% and it could break through, right? So you take a look at the longer term charts here. Just holding the 200 day is gonna be important. If it doesn't, yeah, right about here. I mean, this could go all the way down to the upper 20s. And if you, and if you put that, I don't think KWeb has that history. As long as again, I mean, you know, that's that's pretty strong support right up there around there. My guess is that K Web holds this 200 day moving average because it coincides with other big support levels. So we'll see, but uh, I don't want to do it yet. I think somebody is talking about the buyback for Micron being four billion dollar minimum. But I'm not positive. That's what they're referring to. Accidental has fallen out of bed. I mean, I love these terms. Fallen out of bed. Crash. Oh, let's do this. That's falling out of bed? Really? That's falling out of bed? Oh, all the breathiness. All the breathiness. Cut it out. This is a small retracement. It's getting into a buy zone again. So, like I said, I bought it in the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s. I'm okay with this. Remember, it spits out a pretty big dividend, right? 4%. And remember, total return price. Let's compare XOM and Chevron. Now Chevron's done pretty well, comparatively speaking. But in the last year, who is it? Accidental kicked the crap out of them. Chevron and Exxon. Now you go to three years, I think Chevron's in the lead. Yeah, but that's changed, right? Accidental's always been better, has been better than Exxon a long, long time. But in the last year, since I started talking about it, accidental broke out against both of them. And that's going to keep on happening. Exxon and Chevron have major, major challenges. This is the one you want. You want the blue line, accidental. So if you, if you don't have them and you need a dividend stock in the oil sector, accidental is the one. Buy it on the dip. Um, and you're within a couple dollars of doing it. Yeah. You're real close. I think it'll probably hold this 200 day. And it coincides with this support here too. Breaks the 200 day, you know, then we got problems. Get back down into the middle 60s again. But I think it probably holds. All right. Any other questions before I wrap it up? No? Okay. So in short, we need trade policies. Um... China E50, I don't know what that is. Um, I like K-Web if you're looking for a fund. Um, trade policy, we need to see some of these things get settled. Otherwise, they're very damaging to the economy. The oil trade is on for a few more years. There's going to be some choppiness in the short term. It's going to trend upwards, and it might spike upwards. The buyback bubble is going to end sometime next year. And we have to be aware of that. We have to keep an eye on the VIX, right? Uh, in the short term, we have some hedges on, but we're going to cover those quickly. And then I think we're going to get a rally in Q4, you know, November, December, maybe January. Um, we're going to get to that 3,000 on the S&P 500 that I got mocked for saying uh, a year over a year ago. Um, and then again, when I wrote the, on the, another article this spring, 
but I think that for most of us, if we maintain our asset allocations, which are in the sheets, the Google sheets that we have, um, and we have cash available, and we do our asset allocation the right way, we don't have to be 100% invested to make 100% or more of what the market makes. So we want good risk adjusted returns above all else. Holding cash, you know, even if we reduce our cash holdings for the last couple months of the year, in general, holding cash going into next year is gonna be a big deal. And I know that I got people on that a little bit early, but I know that it takes a while to convince people too. So look for spaces to sell into uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, in the short term, if we get the correction, probably buy it. Uh, I know I will be, and I probably will do something simple like buy QQQ because these, t these technology companies are getting the crap kicked out of them. And let's be realistic. They're not going to suddenly become unprofitable. Google, Facebook, they still are churning out a bunch, bunch of money. I'm, I'm most pessimistic about Facebook uh, just because I, I, I experience it. I, I use it. I pay attention to it. I've been on it since the IPO. I was one of the guys who said buy it in the 20s when it, you know, crashed. Um, I just think the easy money in Facebook's been made. But Google, man, I tell you what, Google, uh, I'll buy them on any dip. That, uh, to me, that's one of the top 10 companies on the planet, if not top two or three. So have a good weekend. Enjoy what's left of the good weather this summer, early autumn, and uh, you know maybe catch some uh, fall leaves here in the next couple of weeks. So we'll be doing a, a presentation pretty much every Friday for the rest of the year, with the possible exceptions of Thanksgiving week and. That's probably it. Possible exception on Thanksgiving week. All right, take care.